Yat A, Shio, hello, and welcome to the third presentation of our Indigenous Speaker Series. The Indigenous Education Institute, IEI, along with the National Parks and Bureau of Land Management, is proud and honored to present A Sense of Place, Indigenous Perspectives of Land and Sky. Our third speaker of the series is Dr. Robin Kimmerer, who will be speaking today. The title of her talk is The Fortress, the River, and the Garden, a model for integration of science and indigenous knowledge. My name is Nancy Maryboy, and I am the founding president of the Indigenous Education Institute. We are a nonprofit institution with an all indigenous board and staff that has been in existence for over 25 years. We're located in the San Juan Islands, Washington, and on the Navajo Nation. Our mission is to preserve, protect, and apply traditional indigenous ways of knowing to contemporary life with a focus on native education, environmental change, and sustainable, healthy environments on earth, water, and skies. Much of our work concerns the creation of collaborations with integrity, between Western science and traditional indigenous ways of knowing. I would like to begin our series today with a heartfelt acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples of the world. Usually we acknowledge the land on which we are living or presenting, but in this day and age of virtual online realities, in this strange age of COVID-19, of self-quarantining, we are honoring indigenous people around the world. This presenta the presentations in this series have been chosen to reflect an awareness of the foundations of traditional thinking. In native ways, everything is interconnected. So rather than a specific focus on biology, astronomy, or other separate disciplines, we will be presenting worlds of interrelationships and processes of reciprocity. I wanna thank you personally for attending this webinar. The interest you have shown is overwhelming. We have over 1,000 people registered from all across the United States, and we have participants from all around the world, including Canada, Indonesia, Brazil, Colombia, Micronesia, Chile, Costa Rica, the Netherlands, Mexico, New Zealand, Australia, Ecuador, the United Kingdom, and South Africa. I would now like to turn the mic over to my colleague, Marcia. Hey everyone, I'm Marcia de Chadnade, the manager for San Juan Islands National Monument. One of the purposes of this monument's designation, as it is defined in law, is for the protection conservation and restoration of the Coast Salish people's resources and cultural properties. We work with 12 Coast Salish tribes to fulfill that purpose. San Juan Island National Historical Park is our partner in this series and wholly with us in our efforts on the ground. Federal land managers across the nation are working on the same challenge and this is one of the points for this speaker series, expanding awareness and understanding for cultural differences to support more successful working relationships for collaboration with integrity. I'm thrilled with the opportunity. I'm thrilled with the opportunity to host Dr. Kimmerer through this speaker series. She has reached so many already through her talents as distinguished teaching professor at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and also through her books and scientific articles. Following her presentation, we'll offer her some of the questions you posed during registration. At the very end of this webinar, you will see a page with contact information for each of the partners, and you're welcome to reach out to all of us, including Dr. Kimmerer herself. This and all of the Sense of Place Indigenous Perspectives on Land and Sky presentations are recorded and can be accessed at the Indigenous Education Institute website shortly following the events. As you have registered by email, we'll also share notices to you for upcoming presentations. Nancy, back to you. 
Okay, thank you, Marcia. It is my greatest pleasure now to introduce to you our guest speaker, Dr. Robin Kimmerer. Robin is an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation who lives in upstate New York. She is a mother, a grandmother, a plant ecologist, a writer, and the SUNY Distinguished Teaching Professor. She's the founding director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment at SUNY in Syracuse, upstate New York, whose mission is to, re is to create programs which draw on the wisdom of both indigenous and scientific knowledge for our shared goals of sustainability. Robin is also the author of one of my favorite books, the award-winning Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of the Plants. She has written many articles and contributed much to the field of literary biology with interests in restoration of ecological communities and the contribution of traditional ecological knowledge to our understanding of the national world. She's also written the award-winning book, Gathering Moss, which focuses on her interest and groundbreaking research on the ecology of mosses. Robin holds a PhD in botany from the University of Wisconsin. She lives on an old farm in upstate New York, tending gardens both cultivated and wild. Many of those, many of, those of you who registered for this talk commented that her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, had hugely impacted their lives. And so many of you also mentioned that you had read the book many times, including myself. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Robin Kimmerer. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, all right, I'm going to, um, first of all, just say hello is my, do I, I need to share my screen here, don't I? Yeah, I wanna say hello to everybody from all these places you're joining us. How exciting. Um, you know, I've been a terrible skeptic of, of online meetings, but what an opportunity for us to gather together and talk about these things that, that we care about so deeply. Um, speaking of caring about it so deeply, I'm also going to set my alarm because I love this stuff so much, I would just keep talking. <laughs> so I'm going to um, set myself an alarm so that I know when to stop so we have plenty of time for your, for your questions. So here, let's do this. Hopefully that works. Can you all see the slides now. All right, good. Um, so as, as Nancy said, I'm going to talk about these metaphors, the fortress, the river, and the garden as models between uh, traditional and scientific knowledges. But first, Sorry, but first I was hoping this would advance. It's not. Um, let me just go here, there. Okay, maybe that'll work. Um, all right. Um, I want to say in our beautiful Potawatomi language, Bojo, Shavadaski Gish, Kokwe Nadeshnikas, Budwe Wadmi Kwenda, Shishi Banyak Nibendagwes, Makodo Dem Minwa, Genu Dodem. And um, in our language, I've told you that I'm an Anishinaabe woman um, of Potawatomi, uh, enrolled in the Citizen Potawatomi of Oklahoma. And I have the privilege of living here in the ancestral territories of the Onondaga Nation. It is also our way that we also begin a gathering such as this with gratitude. And I'd ask us to just cast our minds back to this morning when we put our feet on Mother Earth and to think of all that we had, everything that we need was given to us by Shkakmikwe, by Mother Earth, the beautiful morning air, water to drink, food, companionship of birds and trees and one another. Gratitude for the privilege of our shared work in caring for the land and for one another. And while we are showered with these gifts from Mother Earth, we also know that we live in societies and are somewhat embedded in institutions that relentlessly ask us, what more can we take from the Earth? 
but really the questions that we need to be asking are what does the earth ask of us? What are our responsibilities? And I know that all of you in the audience are, um, are motivated by exactly that question. Um, what does the earth ask of us and what do we have to give? I'm going to focus on just a few of the ways that we might answer that question. And I want to center my teacher, my great teacher, Wingushk, the sweet grass, with the braids of which you see here. And um, this wonderful plant has been a teacher and a guide to me for a long time. And um, we think of in our Anishinaabe creation stories, the uh, sweet grass is understood as the hair of Mother Earth. And that's one of the reasons that we braid it, um, because, you know, when we braid one another's hair, it is a sign of that loving care, that tenderness toward one another, that we want to care for each other. And that's why we braid sweetgrass, as a sign of our, our care for Mother Earth. There are a lot of different teachings about what the three different strands of Wingoshk mean. And for purposes of, of this talk and as the ways in which this plant has been a teacher to me, I think of them as three strands of knowing. Traditional ecological knowledge, indigenous knowledge and philosophy as one of those strands. Secondly, the strand of Western knowledge, of scientific knowledge in which I'm trained as a plant ecologist. But both of those ways are human knowledge and I want to honor that third strand of plant knowledge, the knowledge of the plant people themselves, for they are our great teachers. I want to also acknowledge that the relationship, for me anyway, between those three strands of knowledge has not always been an easy one. And I think given all of our shared work, it is a work in progress for all of us. What is the right relationship between those ways of knowing? How do we braid those knowledges for, to care for, for Mother Earth? So a tiny bit of a story for context. Um, right now here at the end of summer, the goldenrod and the asters are just starting up here in the fields behind my house, maybe where you are as well. And all my life um, from my childhood, when I think I was really born a botanist, um, that uh, the, these plants have been really important to me. And I've always wondered, why is, why is it they grow together? They're so beautiful together. They could grow apart, but they don't. Um, and so fascinated by this is I, I went away to college to study botany. And when I had my freshman interview with my botany professor, he said, so, Miss Wall, why do you want to study botany? And, you know, going as a freshman, um, one of the only women in the forestry college and certainly the only native woman there, I wanted to uh, be prepared. So I had practiced my answer. And I, I said, I want to know why goldenrod and asters look so beautiful together. That's what brings me to study botany. And he looked at me as if I was crazy and said, well, you know, my dear botanists do not concern themselves with beauty. That's not the realm of science. And I said, oh, oh no. Um, well, I also want to know about why the plants make medicines for us. I want to know how the berries grow. I, I, I want to know why you can bend willow for baskets, but not maple. And he again shook his head and said, none of that is science, but tell you what, you enroll in general botany and then you'll learn what it is. That's why I look so happy on that same day in my freshman intake photo. I, had, I was so embarrassed at that time I felt like I'd really made a mistake, both in that I didn't have the right answers to satisfy a scientist, but also the things that I knew and loved about plants had been swept from the table. I was told that those didn't matter, that those weren't welcome in the university and in institutional science. And there's a way in which that experience is really an echo of my grandfather's first day of education, higher education, as well as a little boy at the Carlisle Indian School. Whereas on his first day 
of, of, of education, he told too was told that his ways of knowing, his ways of thinking were not welcome, and that in fact um, they needed to be erased and replaced. This model of colonialism, this model of assimilation that we know through the history of our people can persist in institutional science and does in many, many arenas. And so the work that we are all doing to bring together multiple ways of knowing, to make ways of knowing that have been marginalized and violently taken from our people, um, to bring them to the table, to bring them, um, shine a light on all the gifts that they offer is, is our shared work. So I couldn't, um, I, I had a hard time, I will say, um, in those first years of college because of this worldview shift that I experienced. In my worldview, nature is subject. These trees that you see here are people, they're persons. But of course, in the way of Western science that I was encountering, um, the ecosystem was understood as a machine, as, as things. You know, when I saw this diagram, this is what an ecosystem is, um, I thought I had signed up for engineering by mistake. Um, it was a really foreign worldview. I had unknowingly crossed a boundary into unfamiliar territory. One of the most profound differences that I found, and uh, I think in all of the work that we do in National Park Service, BLM, and all the arenas in which all of us are, are working, we encounter these different worldview perspectives on what land means. And through the Western lens, there's some pretty simple definitions that land is natural resources, as if it wasn't intrinsically valuable. Uh, land as capital is another important element of this meaning of, of land. And probably first and foremost is land as property, as private property. And land as the source of uh, ecosystem services. And those in this concept map, that is kind of how we think about land and certainly how we used to teach about um, land management from this perspective. But what if, what if we put on a different lens and say, what if land is the source of your identity? That your identity is inseparable from your home place? What if land is the sustainer, the one who takes care of you? What if land is not only your home, but it's the residence of all of your relatives, your more than human relatives? Land as the connection to our ancestors and certainly through our actions to our descendants. Land as a library where knowledge is housed and resident and generated by the land, not by people, not by a single authority, um, but by the land and all our relations. That land is a healer, not only as a pharmacy of healing plants, but through spiritual healing as well as physical healing. Because we understand the land not to be a thing, but as in spirited community, that the land is our home. And in contrast to thinking about land as property, whether it's federal property, private property, um, instead of thinking about the property rights through the indigenous worldview, the, the word really is responsibility. Land is not the place we have rights to, but the place we have moral responsibility for. And of course, the land as sacred. If this is what land means through the lens of traditional thinking, then our work as land managers, as land caretakers, I don't like that word managers, we don't manage our relatives, right? Um, when we think about land as our relatives and not natural resources, management doesn't really make much sense. All of the beings on that land, particularly, particularly the plants, are understood as persons. Again, not objects, not ecosystem entities, but persons with their own gifts, their own responsibilities. And the plants in particular are known not only as persons, but as our oldest teachers. Who else, after all, can 
fix light and air and sun and, and water into food and give it away so generously. Likewise, medicines, the plants we really use as our guides. And so here is a plant-loving young native student caught between a worldview in which plants are persons and plants are, and the rest of the ecosystem is, is object. And this dichotomy in worldview continues to be at the root of many of the impediments and the barriers to cross-cultural collaboration in the care of land. And so we're going to um, spend some time talking about these, these very notions. You probably are familiar with medicine wheel thinking. It is a concept map, a mind map um, for many Anishinaabe um, uh, concepts. So much to say about it, but the one thing I'll focus on at th uh, this afternoon is that it is a map of knowledge. And it reminds us that we as human people have at least four different ways of, of understanding. Certainly with the intellect, we have mental knowledge we also have physical knowledge, embodied knowledge. We also have emotional intelligence and we have spiritual knowledge. And I have been told many times that unless we understand something with all four of those quadrants, with all four of those And so the questions that I had for my botany professor fell all around the medicine wheel. And what he was telling me was that Western science privileges only the intellect, only the mental knowledge, right? And to some extent, the body, body knowledge in what we can observe and measure. But that spirit and emotion were specifically excluded from his way of thinking and was recommended ought to be excluded from mine. This wholeness of, of traditional knowledge is one of its primary gifts. And I think of, of Western science in a way as a subset of all of this. Um, yes, Western science lives in the realms of mind and body, um, which are also present in traditional knowledge, um, but there's much more to it. And, um, you know, I'm about to start teaching next week, so I'm thinking about my introductory students where we tell them that when we think about evolution and what drives adaptation and evolution, we know that the raw material of evolution is genetic diversity. And when we look around at climate chaos, at the age of the sixth extinction, at all the social pathologies in which we are enmeshed, we know that we need cultural evolution. We need adaptation to these changing times. And what is it that will drive that? In parallel, it's intellectual diversity that can lead us toward uh, cultural uh, evolution. And it is this intellectual diversity of inclusion of indigenous ways of knowing that primarily interests me. And I'm so proud to tell you that right down the hall from the same office where I was told that um, indigenous ways of thinking were not welcome in, in science, we have today the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. And uh, as, as Nancy uh, nicely mentioned, that our, our mission is a multiplicity of knowledges. How do we bring together multiple ways of knowing to care for the land? We really draw on the thinking of, of the Mi'kmaq elders, uh, the marshals, who brought the, to the world this notion of two-eyed seeing. Um, and so we can see with the lens of Western science. We can also see with the indigenous lens. And when we bring those things together, how much more powerful is our vision? I want to be very clear with this graphic, which a student, one of our students prepared, I just love it, um, is that what we're talking about is the all important word and. This isn't indigenous or Western science, it's indigenous and Western science to magnify our understanding. 
So I understand from, from the questions that many of you said that you're already pretty familiar with what is traditional ecological knowledge. So I'm not going to say too much about this, except for to say of who holds traditional knowledge. Traditional knowledge does not come with a chromosome. It comes with relationship, it comes with being a student of the land and, and learning from intelligences other than our own, um, both from the land and from our ancestors. We know that, and, and commonly, sometimes people think that traditional knowledge is just this small circle here. It's the local knowledge of land, animals, water, etc. It is that, but it's also the resource management systems that govern those, those beings and the way we interact with them. It's the social institutions, and indeed it is this all-important element of worldview that we've been talking about. If you ask traditional people, what does traditional knowledge mean? Um, you get lots of different um, interpretations, but really that it's a way of life. It's not a static body of knowledge. It's a process. It's a way of being in the world, which is simultaneously biophysical and ethical. And the ethics and the, and the empiricism can't be uncoupled from one another as they can be in, in Western science. And so the way that I try to think about this is that Western science is super good at hypothesis testing, right? Um, it's really good at essentially true-false questions. Um, but, but Western science can't really approach right-wrong questions. Um, and that's where the holism of indigenous science becomes particularly important. Within the scope of TEK, we know it includes agricultural knowledge, pharmaceutical knowledge, knowledge of, of plants and animals, populations. Um, it includes ethno-taxonomy of naming. It includes adaptation and climate change. It includes such deep knowledge of biodiversity. This graph is something I wanna spend just a minute of figure that, that um, perhaps you've seen this. It's pretty familiar to conservation biologists because it's a map of biodiversity hotspots all over the world. But mapped on top of those biodiversity hotspots, what you're looking at is language diversity which is a surrogate for cultural diversity. They map almost one to one with one another. Biodiversity hotspots are cultural diversity hotspots. And this is no coincidence. It has everything to do with this, um, with the biophysical knowledge as well as the ethical knowledge. And we know that all over the country, all over the world, wherever you are sitting, not far from you, are these amazing new examples and in fact, many ancient examples of, of models of sustainability in indigenous homelands, so much of which has been um, dismissed or marginalized, and our work is to bring it to the fore. Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. And so now, and we think about bringing these knowledges together, um, I, I want to particularly highlight this in light of my work in, in training a new generation of indigenous um, conservationists, sustainability environmental scientists. And one of my students, as she was about to graduate, said these words. She was just finishing her master's degree in ecology. And she said, I don't want to be known in my community as a scientist. What? Oh want her to be proud of her accomplishments, and she was, but she said, I don't want to be, have that label. I want to be known as somebody working on behalf of land and people. And it cut me right to the core to say, why can't those be the same things? What is it about our perceptions in communities, and Native communities in particular, about scientists that mean that these two things are not the same? And that's where we really wanted to talk about these knowledge integration models. Um, if my student could feel that way, how is it? What has been the relationship between TEK and what I call SEK, scientific ecological knowledge? And how do we create a more productive relationship? I know that's what you care about too. 
So as, as a writer and a, and, and a thinker, I think in metaphor. It's just the way my brain works. And so the dominant metaphor that comes to mind for how science is often understood by the public and um, including um, communities on the land is that science is like a, a fortress. It's, a, it's high on the hill. It's removed from people. It's not part of everyday occurrence. And that it's something of a monoculture, an intellectual monoculture. Why this metaphor of the fortress? Well, think about how we generate scientific knowledge, brick by brick, with reductionist units of, of, of knowledge making, right? Um, it is a community of really specialized workers. You're either inside those walls or you're outside. Um, it, and those doors are narrow, hard to get in. The, the approach to knowledge generation is strictly materialist, very objective. It is regimented. It's like there's one way toward truth and knowledge. And the knowledge generated within the fortress, in the public perception, that knowledge becomes property. And in many cases, it's commodified property, knowledge for sale. And all of us as scientists um, are responsible for this other element of why this, why science is understood as a, as a fortress. It's because of the language that we use in our, in our communicating about science. We use language that excludes participation by people outside the walls of that fortress. No wonder it's misunderstood. Science is also perceived as the fortress, particularly in communities of color, because of the long and troubled history, colonial history, of science exerting power over social systems and over biological systems. We can't look away from the fact that Western science, um, in addition to the positive benefits that it provides, has also been an agent of environmental destruction. And when we think about this idea of a knowledge monoculture, one of the destructive elements of, of, of parts of Western science is that it marginalizes all other ways of knowing, that it creates a, and devalues indigenous ways of knowing and has been a powerful assimilative agent of, of, of making indigenous knowledge invisible. And so here we are, I'm trying to make it visible again now in the year 2020. We're very late to this work. I also want to say in all fairness that the, the metaphor, as all metaphors, is, is, is limited. Are we really talking about science as a fortress or is it scientism, which is the fortress? I think that science as a, as a value-free, curiosity-driven pursuit of knowledge is different than science coupled to a Western worldview, coupled to an economic system, particularly capitalism. Um, and so I think it's scientism which really has created that fortress, not so much science um, alone. But we know today that a model of knowledge which excludes human values is not of particular is not of the is not the tool that we need when we sit at the intersection of human values and um, and environmental destruction. We need a broader way of thinking, and this is one of the ways that the medicine wheel thinking, the holism of TEK, is particularly important. I have to agree with Kenny Osubel, who said we're going to need the enduring knowledge of indigenous science as well as the best of leading edge Western science. It's high tech meets high tech. But how do they meet? How do we do that? One of the um, phrases that I hear often about um, relationship between knowledge is, is that, that our work is to blend knowledge systems, to blend TEK and SEK. And I want to say that um, this notion of blending um, is, is not the pathway forward, in, certainly in, in my work. Why not? Because what happens when you blend 
when you blend something, identity is lost, sovereignty is lost, holism is lost, particularly when there is a huge power differential between those knowledge systems. I'm not interested in blending knowledge systems. As you'll see from the models that I'm going to share with you today, I'm interested in sovereign knowledge systems that stand on their own and work together and collaborate, but are not blended. So if we look to Indigenous knowledge systems, what are some of the models out there that might guide us to right relationship between these knowledges? One of the models which I find particularly useful is this one, the two-row wampum, uh, the Gaswenta of the Haudenosaunee. I don't have time to, to say too much about this model, save to say that it is an agreement, um, it is a treaty uh, between the Dutch and the Haudenosaunee, and the belt with the white bead says, we will share the river of life. We can, there's plenty of abundance here. We can, we can live side by side. And the purple bands represent that side by side, the settlers in their ship, and the original peoples in their canoe will share the river of life, going down the river side by side. But notice that this is a model of autonomy. This is not a model of one directing the other. It is mutual respect and, and autonomy. Those paths do not intersect. Uh, the treaty says that, that the ship shall not steer the canoe and the canoe shall not interfere with the uh, ship. So this notion of two vessels sharing the river of life is a, can be, it is a political document, but it's also a metaphor for coexistence between knowledge systems and has been used by a number of scholars um, in, in that regard. But that agreement also says that we will care for the river of life and we will care for each other's knowledge systems. And we know that neither of those things has really been fully upheld, no? We know that many times the river looks like this, and we know that the that the SEK knowledge system has in many cases sought to displace indigenous knowledge. And so my concern is that rather than autonomy and, and coexistence, don't we have a, an ethical mandate to engage TEK, indigenous philosophy, and steer the ship, grab a hold of that wheel before we all drown in the results. And so to think about how do we go from coexistence to symbiosis? What is an indigenous model for knowledge relationship that goes beyond the two row? And maybe it's because I'm a botanist and a gardener. Um, I always turn to the plants for guidance and a source of wisdom. And when we look at the Three Sisters garden, I think here we find a metaphor and a model for creating a mutualism among knowledge systems. I'm going to assume that in this audience, you're all pretty familiar with the concept of, of a three sisters polyculture, which is a manifestation of the brilliance of indigenous plant sciences, where the corn, the beans, and the squash all grow together and in their differences support each other, where the corn creates a ladder for light availability for the beans. The beans fertilize the soil so that the corn can get that tall. And the squash, of course, suppresses weeds and keeps the soil nice and moist. We also know that the food yield and the nutritional yield from a Three Sisters polyculture far exceeds what would happen if we grew them each in monoculture. So why a garden metaphor? Well, because both TEK and SEK are rooted in the knowledge of the earth. The earth is really how holds the knowledge, and these are both ways of trying to express it and understand it. I choose a garden metaphor because we are growing this symbiosis. It's going to change and develop as we do, as our understanding deepens. I choose the Three Sisters Garden because of the sovereignty of corn, beans, and squash. The corn doesn't become the bean. The bean doesn't try to overwhelm the squash, right? There's no compromise of identity. They are equal partners. They're more productive together. 
and it's good for land and it's good for people. And I think the same is true for a symbiosis between TEK and SEK. How do we plant this garden? Again, with honoring that the land is our teacher, that the land is our library and our healer, and that both of these ways of knowing grow out of, of the earth. And the first thing that we plant and recognize is corn. When I plant my three sisters garden, corn always goes in first. When we think about this knowledge symbiosis, I think traditional knowledge comes first. It is the elder knowledge. It can be this, it is the intellectual scaffolding for this knowledge garden. And the corn, of course, immensely productive, fast growing, an ancient crop domesticated by the genius of indigenous science. And so we plant it first and let it flourish. Very importantly, because oftentimes when we teach about multiple ways of knowing, we teach about Western science first, as if it was the elder knowledge, as if it was the dominant knowledge, and we somehow fit in other cultural ways of knowing around it. And what I am advocating for is to reverse that, to put the elder knowledge first. Scientific knowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, I think of as metaphorically like the bean. Very powerful, very curious, wandering in all sorts of realms. It enriches the symbiosis with the power of its underground structures. But we also know that in a three sisters garden, the beans behave because they are guided by the corn. The beans blossom and put their leaves out between the corn leaves, don't they? You know what happens if you plant your beans in such a way that they don't get to climb on the corn? It becomes a tangle. It becomes a monoculture. It becomes dominance rather than coexistence. And so this guiding relationship between beans and corn is central to this metaphor. So we can think about a symbiosis of knowledge generation, which is enriched by the power of Western scientific tools, but guided by indigenous principles and philosophy. What might that look like? Our original instructions of respect, reciprocity, reverence, responsibility, relationship, all of those are the shaping guidelines um, uh, that might guide Western science. Could become more specific. I'm not gonna read all of these. You can have a look at them, but does the research, does the work that we're doing promote intergenerational equity? That's a guiding principle. Does it show respect for both human and non-human persons? Does it support sovereignty? Is it grounded in humility? Does it couple knowledge to responsibility? Those are the guiding principles of this elder knowledge that I think could make science, Western science as a caretaking tool even more powerful. And then we get to the squash. Um, and the squash, of course, is, is creating a climate, a microclimate in which corn and beans can uh, work well together, um, shading the soil, keeping out competitors, um, uh, modulating moisture. And so really we think about ourselves, our institutions. Are our institutions behaving like squash? Are our institutions creating a microclimate where TEK and SEK can grow collaboratively, collaboratively together? Oftentimes the answer is no. Um, and, and the squash is a great teacher of how we create this place between worldviews where cross-cultural exchange can happen. This is our work. And so together we think about TEK, SEK, and this ethical space of cross-cultural engagement. And that is a knowledge mutualism in which land and people um, all benefit, that, that it is richer together than, than alone. Many teachers also talk about the fact that there has to be a fourth sister. And that fourth sister is the gardener, the one who prepares the soil, who harvests the seeds, who saves the seeds, who honors them and plants them the next year. And that too is, is our work um, to harvest, to nurture, to plant this knowledge garden. How do we do that? 
how do we nurture it from this to fullness? I hesitate to say that one of our jobs as the fourth sister is to tend the SEK garden, because honestly, over the last 500 years, the Western science garden has flourished. Um, and, um, but how does it need maybe a little pruning? Um, I think that as scientists, one of our jobs in tending this SEK garden so that we can have collaboration and mutualism of knowledges is to decouple science from scientism. Um, and from the scientific worldview, just to recognize that difference and to recognize this as a colonial structure and decolonize SEK by separating it from the scientific worldview. We can work to free science from commodification. We can also encourage one another and our students and our colleagues to um, be better storytellers, to come outside the fortress and democratize science and bring it into the citizenry so that it is more accessible and can grow from what people, ordinary people, add to it. Oops, I thought there was another slide here. There is. Well, somehow I missed it. There should be a slide here also that says tending the TEK garden. Maybe I, anyway, the T, tending the TEK garden, let me just say, involves caring for sovereignty, caring for indigenous homelands, participating in language preservation, language revitalization that holds TEK, um, support for tribal colleges, support for um, authentic engagement and consultation with tribal nations. I wish that slide was here. Maybe it'll mysteriously appear. Um, but the point here is that this knowledge mutualism metaphor is, is, is a symbiosis of science guided by, by traditional principles um, so that all are fed. Lastly, um, I want to give a little bit of a, an example about how, um, let me just look at my clock and see how lastly I am here. Um, oh, good. Um, uh, you'll remember we had this question at the outset of what does the earth ask of us. And the one piece of this that I want to focus on together, because I think it, it encompasses a lot of the work that many of you are doing, is to clean up our mess, um, to heal, to do restoration. And um, how can this symbiosis between TEK and SEK help us do restoration ecology better? That's what I want to finish up with. And restoration as a primary example of the ways in which human people can be a positive influence on the land. Again, if we try to decolonize conservation, one of the notions in conservation is that humans and people, humans and nature are a bad mix, right? And that we should keep them apart in order for nature to flourish. And within the TEK paradigm, we know that there are mutually beneficial relationships between land and people based on indigenous science. And restoration is one of these. In restoration ecology and restoration science, traditional knowledge has really been overlooked. And um, this is just a short list of some of the ways in which it's really important to bring TEK to the table in our restoration work. I'll talk about each one of these um, just very briefly. First of all, restoration ecologists always begin with the question of what are we restoring to, i.e. the reference ecosystem. And traditional ecological knowledge has been well documented as a, a vital resource in identifying that reference ecosystem. Um, you know reference ecosystems from the SEK perspective, but perhaps less so from the TEK perspective, where oral histories, ethnographies, contemporary and traditional harvesting practices, management practices, these can all inform um, what is the target uh, ecosystem condition that we want to heal to. Another really important way that TEK influences um, identification of, of, of reference ecosystems and implementation of restoration practice is through um, return of traditional land management practices. 
I know probably everybody on this call is already well aware of this, right? Of particularly in thinking about the, the role of indigenous burning, the sophisticated science of, of indigenous burning, um, which was dismissed by, by Western science, right? And today is having a resurgence as we understand the, the brilliance of that system. You're looking here at the prairies of Bekejwanong First Nation, uh, Walpole Island First Nation, also known as. Um, this has the most biodiverse tall grass prairie on the planet. Oh, how, what is the generator of that kind of diversity? Annual burning by the Odawa, um, uh, Ojibwe and Potawatomi people who take their responsibility for this exercise of land care um, uh, very seriously as a spiritual as well as a material practice. Indigenous languages are an important element in um, identifying reference ecosystems. Just a tiny story, because I love this story so much, that was shared with me by Gary Nabhan. He talks about working with Fish and Wildlife Service to identify critical habitat for the desert tortoise that you see here. And um, as the scientists were um, evaluating potential areas for critical habitat designation, um, they realized they didn't really know enough about the, the habitat needs of this, of this animal. And Gary brought um, a colleague of his along, uh, Tahono Autumn botanist. Um, and uh, she came along on all these reconnaissance field trips and on one place she, she spoke up and, and, and uh, told the, the assembled scientists the name of the plant in this particular valley in which they were standing. And the name of the plant in the Tahano Autumn language is Desert Tortoise Eats It. The essentiality of indigenous languages for conservation and sustainability. When we think about how restoration has been understood in a solely monocultural way and only an SEK way, we know that restoration really began with reclamation, didn't it? The notion of we better get something green growing on this mine waste. Um, doesn't matter what it is, just get something growing there. That was the science, so-called, of, of reclamation. Fortunately, out of reclamation grew true ecological restoration, um, which is, as you see, I think here, um, the National Research Council went way beyond reclamation to say that the damage to the resource has to be repaired, but the structure and the function of, a, of the natural ecosystem needs to be returned. Recreating the form without the function is not restoration. The goal is to emulate nature. This is huge. This is a huge step forward in thinking about what restoration is. And it continues to dominate most of the restoration practice, especially on federal lands um, in, in this country. And so on the left-hand side of your screen, you see this, the elements of this, of this view of ecological restoration, the SEK view. It's an imposed solution. It takes a, a decades to do, but the notion is we're going to put structure and function back in place. On the right side of the screen, you see restoration priorities and strategies from the Indigenous Peoples Restoration Network. The very first thing they say is to restore relationship to land. In this TEK paradigm, relation comes first. Relationships of respect and reciprocity between people and place have to be healed first simultaneously with addressing hydrology, vegetation, soils, etc. Et, et oh, there's my alarm. All right, I'm almost done here. <laughs> um, and in this quote from the Indigenous Environmental Network, we see this holism of the medicine wheel again, saying that cultural survival depends on healthy land and healthy relationship between humans and land. And that part of that relationship, let me just read this middle part because I think it's so important to our work, to say that ecological restoration is inseparable from cultural and spiritual restoration, inseparable from the spiritual responsibilities of caregiving and, and world renewal. It assigns to Western science the all-important role of being the head and the hands, 
of, of, of ecological restoration, the mind and the body on the medicine wheel, but that it needs to be guided by the heart and the spirit. And so it is this holistic look at, at restoration. And so when we bring in that TEK perspective, what we're talking about is not only healing the land, but healing relationship to land. And that's in the realm of biocultural restoration. This holistic approach means that we not only restore structure and function, but we restore relationship to place. And we can restore relationship in such a way that it brings us all the way to what I call reciprocal restoration. Reciprocal restoration to me is when the work that we are doing to use cultural knowledge to heal the land, not only heals the land, but heals the cultures as well. That in order to do this work of land restoration and cultural revitalization, there is a mutualism between them. In healing the land, we are healing ourselves. I think I will stop there. I have an example um, of how we might do this, um, but there are lots of examples and you probably um, can put your finger on, on, on your own as well. So at this point I'll say mi iu, mi uh, thank you, and I'll be happy to take uh, some questions. Well, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kimmer. Uh, that is so inspiring and on point for the conversations we're engaging in daily. Oh, perfect. Uh, that's, right. Yes, for sure. That slide on restoration, uh, philosophically especially, a terrific summary of the conversations we're moving through. I'm going to bet there are numerous revisits of this program uh, when it's posted on the Indigenous Education website. So thank you so much for sharing this. Uh, I'm really moved. Okay, but let's uh, move forward to some of the questions that folks, when they were registering, uh, had for you. And um, I pulled out a number of them that were, that represented groups of people and groups of interest. Um, one of them would be uh, in wake of climate change. Many things are in our environment, many things in are in our environment that are changing. What do you see as the greatest challenges and hopes for tribal communities? The challenge, of course, is that our homelands are very closely prescribed, aren't they? And I think about the, any of the reservation communities. We can't move. These are our homelands. We often hear mainstream folks saying, well, we can always move. Um, we're not moving. These are our homelands. We have to adapt in place. We have to care for our places. And one of the greatest challenges, of course, is that indigenous peoples suffer disproportionate effects of climate change and with the least amount of contribution to the drivers of that, of that climate change. So it's an important uh, justice issue for, for our people as well. The strength though, that I think one of the things that we bring to this, I think about in my own people, I guess, let me just invoke that, that the citizen Potawatomi nation, we, our reserve is in Oklahoma today. That was not our homeland. We're Great Lakes people. We're Southern Great Lakes people. And so after the, the Treaty of Chicago in 1838, we experienced a tremendous climate change in that we were marched at gunpoint from, from Southern Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, to, Oklahoma, to Kansas and Oklahoma. We know something about the trauma of climate change, the, da the damage associated with climate change. But out of that history, we also know what are the sources of strength and resilience. And one of the most important of those is knowledge sharing with each other. You think, how did, how did our people survive? How did so many of us survive these, these, these relocations that are essentially parallel to climate change is by sharing knowledge with each other 
and by always learning from the land. And I think that within traditional knowledge, as I said at the outset, traditional knowledge comes from learning from the land, that one of our greatest assets is this cultural knowledge for how to learn from the land. The land is changing. The land is changing at our hands, but that doesn't change the fact that it's still our teacher and our ability to, to model our responses after the responses of the land is, I think, a, a, a really potential source of, of resilience, among others. We could talk all day about that question. Thank you. Thank you. Another group of people were interested in hearing what might be some shared protocol with and among Indigenous communities when it comes to Indigenous ecological knowledge, and how is this observed, collated, protected, or shared? I want to be sure that I understand the question of, are you talking about protocols for knowledge sharing of, between TEK and SEK? Or, or among Native communities? These people spoke of among Indigenous communities. Okay. I think probably because we, because we who aren't of Indigenous communities have, have a lot of connection with Indigenous communities, it would, be, it would be good to know how we should proceed with protocols as well. Okay. I think what, one of the places that I would start is that um, a really important part of knowledge sharing goes back to a, one of the foundational principles of traditional ecological knowledge, and that is that knowledge is coupled to responsibility, that, that knowledge is not shared and disseminated without responsibility being shared and disseminated first as well. And this has, in my experience, often been a stumbling block in communication cross-culturally because in Western science, knowledge for knowledge sake, it's property, it's a commodity, it flows really easily. But that notion that we have responsibility for knowledge, which is a spiritual responsibility as, as well as a, as a physical responsibility. And so that I think is the underpinning for any protocol. Um, and there are a lot of culturally specific protocols from, from one group of people to the next about, about how knowledge is shared, but it always incorporates, um, uh, I, from the Western science perspective, we call it citations and, and references. I think of it as really looking at the genealogy of knowledge. Where did it come from? What's the lineage of knowledge? And that's part of the responsibility of sharing it, is sharing about um, where did it come from? What are the responsibilities attendant to it? So being mindful of, of cultural protocols associated with protection of knowledge to be sure that it isn't misused, appropriated, um, taken out of context is, is really important. Because one of the things that um, I have experienced and, and, and observed is what I call knowledge mining. Sometimes, um, particularly in sharing between Western science and, and, and uh, indigenous science, is that by knowledge mining, I mean that Western scientists will sometimes um, identify a piece of traditional knowledge that they say, oh, yes, that is so interesting. I, I'm going to value that because it fits in my paradigm. I'm going to take that and, and, and hold on to it. Um, but what happens to the context for it? That knowledge can't shouldn't be separated from its context. The cultural context then becomes like mind tailings. You just take the ore and leave all the rest behind without learning and growing from that cultural context. And that does damage to the cultural context. And it devalues that little nugget of knowledge that someone took. Um, yeah, so um, to, be, to be mindful not to do knowledge mining is another important responsibility.
Great. Thank you for that. That's really insightful too. Uh, okay. And another group of people here are interested in educational opportunities. Uh, they ask, um, how do we integrate indigenous ways of knowing and storytelling into teaching with a very analytical, factual subject matter, uh, the way STEM has schools focused? Oh, I love that question. I want to say the story of my life, <laughs> as you saw from the very beginning of finding that that indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing were, are generally not welcome in the STEM disciplines. Fortunately, that's changing. What I try to do, and I, I teach in a, in a very science-based institution, um, but what I try to do at the outset is to introduce medicine wheel thinking and, and to say, here are all of these ways of knowing, let's use them all. Um, and that becomes a very explicit framework for enlarging knowledge. Um, without that explicit framework, um, I think sometimes there's the risk of, of perception that you're not doing science right. Um, wait, you can't, you can't include emotion or spirit in science, but if you're from the outset say, I understand this is how Western science works and it excludes these two things, we're going to see what is the value added of bringing all of those pieces back together again. So explicitly understanding the framework for traditional knowledge gives you um, a beautiful platform for, for bringing in storytelling and, and, and cultural knowledge and, and enables one to, um, to give equal validity to that kind of knowledge as opposed to knowledge that was, you know, in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, indigenous knowledge is peer-reviewed too, over generations and generations. Um, and uh, that's another story. Sorry, go on. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, one that is particularly relevant to us out here, uh, how have you or have you ever worked with or heard of a tribal advisory committee for managing public lands? Broadly speaking, I, I don't know. I know of ones for specific pieces of land, but not broadly speaking. Maybe you could share what you know of a of specific pieces of land, if there were any um, accomplishments or successes, challenges. Well, one of the examples, I'm trying to think about particularly in federal land, I think about, um, let's talk about the bear's ears. Um, that there was an intertribal council um, brought together to think about the delineation of the Bears Ears National Monument, um, its, its meanings in all around the medicine wheel, and the way of thinking about how might traditional ecological knowledge be used in integration into the management plan for that national monument. It was um, really a, a beacon of and a model for how to integrate uh, traditional and scientific knowledges. And uh, that's perhaps one of the most high profile um, examples that, that, that I'm aware of. Um, and hopefully one day, one day soon, that will come to pass. All okay, right, thank you, thank you. Uh, another group of federal land managers are interested uh, in, they're planning in areas of significant cultural importance to multiple local tribes. Have you any suggestions or systems for how agencies might use more traditional management techniques that allow areas to be utilized by tribal members for collecting various different plant materials or educating tribal youth or the general public about traditional stewardship. Yeah, fabulously important. As we know, there's a long history of, of Native peoples being removed from federal lands. And, and to, um, to prioritize uh, traditional customary use on federal lands is not only federal lands, but private lands as well, private conservation lands. Um, these 
uh, nascent efforts um, to return people to place. Um, in many cases, what we know, in fact, the example that I, I didn't have time to share is one in which um, we demonstrate in biocultural reciprocal restoration, really, how traditional harvesting practices actually are key, are key to the conservation of a cultural keystone species. Um, if you say you want to protect that particular cultural species, you can't protect it without bringing back the harvesters, you, without bringing back traditional land management practices. And so looking for those kinds of opportunities to restore access to, to federal lands for tribal uh, peoples, um, for customary use, for ceremony, for land management. I'm really heartened by um, some of the work that's going on in fire science, where um, uh, the traditional burning protocols are being um, uh, incorporated into federal land management in some places. Uh, so there are a lot of good examples, I think. We need more of them, though. Thank you. I, I agree. I agree. So, um, some folks are just worried about how it is respectful to, to refer to indigenous people, uh, whether to call them indigenous people or this person uh, refers to the Coast Salish people or people of the Sailor Sea, um, sovereign nation, but not all indigenous people are treaty tribes. Do you have any suggestions? Sure. Um, the suggestion is, is, is to change or adapt, I guess I should say, adapt your language to the people that you're talking about. Um, when most Native people um, don't c consider themselves part of a, well, I, I shouldn't say it that way, our identity is associated with our, our home people. Um, say we, you are a member of the Potawatomi Nation, you're Menominee, you're Onondaga. Um, that I think is the most respectful way um, of, of address, addressing and, and v more broadly speaking, I think the term indigenous peoples, that S is super important to um, uh, recognize the tremendous cultural diversity um, of, of Native peoples, Indigenous peoples are around the world. And that term also conveys the sovereignty that, that Native uh, peoples are political entities as well as cultural entities. And that's um, a really important distinction. Yeah, thank you. Really great points that you've made uh, following your presentation. Um, we have gotten a lot from you. I really appreciate the time that you've spent pulling this together for us. Um, I know Dr. Mary Boy was interested in connecting with you briefly, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Nancy, if you are ready. And maybe while she's doing that, uh, Dr. Kimmer, if you had any other points you wanted to share, I can see Nancy's got a minute or two on her before she's going to pull up. Had you, I, the example that you had for us at the end of your presentation, do you want to refer back to that or? Oh, um, it was an example of reciprocal restoration in a project that we did in restoring sweetgrass at a um, Mohawk community. Um, and within the Western paradigm, conservation biologists, of course, would say, um, well, if you want to protect sweetgrass, you should keep harvesters away from it, right? Within that colonial paradigm, you separate people and, and a plant that is threatened. Um, and through our research, which was completely driven by questions and observations of sweetgrass harvesters and basket makers themselves. They were the source of the, of, of the hypotheses and, and participated in the research as well. What we um, demonstrated was that in order for sweetgrass to thrive, it needs to be harvested. That the traditional practices of, of, of harvesting um, caused the sweetgrass 
to flourish in the control plots that were never harvested, that Western conservation biologists would say, oh, those are the plots that are gonna do best where people leave them alone. Nope, where they're left alone, they start to diminish. Um, so this reciprocal arrangement between the harvesters and the sweetgrass was really, really important um, that, that they are linked in reciprocity with one another. So that means that, that, that biocultural restoration is essential. You can't just restore the plant. You have to restore the people who love it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Robin. I cannot tell you how I love how much I loved your talk, and it sparked so many um, little things in my brain as you were talking. I could I could just it all resonated with me in in a in a really great way. Um, I've had the pleasure of reading everybody's registration, so there were over. Uh, a thousand of them, and some I, people I wrote back to, some people I printed out their questions and sent them on to you and to Marsha, um, and and some of them I, people I knew and some of them I didn't, but I got an idea of where people were from. There's many, many tribal people that signed into this talk, many people that are land stewards, whether it's um, on a federal level or on an indigenous level or both. And I could just visualize how certain people were responding to certain things you were talking about, certain examples you were giving. And I thought, this is so spot on. This is just so perfect for people to hear. Um, you were able to touch so many of their situations by what you presented today. And I think it's gonna be like throwing a stone into the water, into the ocean, seeing it skip along. It's just gonna have many, um, associations in the future that we can't even imagine right now. But um, I particularly wanted to just say something about bear's ears because that's um, very close to my family and my um, one of my brothers has spent, a, off, two of them have spent much, much time on trying to um, have, have this be a permanent um, uh, place for that people can go and, 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 and re and it hasn't been totally ruined that they are even as we speak it's being um caretaken by the tribes of five six tribes that have all have an ancestral relationship with that land so they're still they have a wonderful website and they're just um i just think it's, it's such a great example of of tribes and scientists coming together uh, to 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 bring about some of the restoration of spiritually physically, mentally that you've been talking about. So um, I, I, I wanted to um, especially thank you for that. I wish we had hours more with you, Robin, because you mentioned some models I would love to have heard about and some other things that you touched on. But I, um, I, can't, t I can't tell you how grateful we are to have you as, as a speaker today because it touches everything that we wanted in this series. In other words, this kind of knowledge with this kind of diverse audiences. Um, and so from the bottom of my heart, many thanks. Um, this has been a real honor to host you today. So uh, basically you have all my gratitude. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we are recording all of the um, speakers' presentations, and they will be available on our Indigenous Education Institute website, which is www.indigenouseducation.org. Um, give our, um, our wonderful technician, Chris, give him some time to pull this together and, and put it on, on the website, but it will be there in, in a few days to a week. And you can uh, tell anybody that they can come in even if they missed the call today. Um, the recordings will also will also contain all the PowerPoints as well as the uh, speaking part of the presentation. So if you're like me, you're going to go back to them and look at them over and over again. Um, and uh, my particular interest, of course, is in native astronomy and everything you were saying about the plants, you could say about astronomy, everything you said about the scientists, you could say about the barriers we had to 
push against us. We were going through graduate school and, and trying to make our way in this world. So um, it's all interconnected. And, and there's so many, there so many wonderful examples of the stars and the sun and the moon also playing this huge role in stewarding the plants and the, um, and, and the animals and the birds. And it, it's just all interconnected in the most incredible complex way. Uh, let's see, I, I would like to um, extend a few thank yous here before we get off. I wanted to thank Chris Terran from Terran Solutions. I wanted to thank Art Ferraro and Jeff Cooper from the BLM Cater. Um, and they're the reason this went smoothly today. I mean, imagine people from all over the world being able to phone into a Zoom and, and, and talk back and forth with you, Rob. And I think, um, I think there are some real benefits in being on the internet. And this was certainly a good example. Um, I also want to acknowledge the BLM, the San Juan Islands National Monument, and its superintendent, Marcia de Chardonnay as well as the San Juan Island National Historical Park and its superintendent, Alexis Friedi, and Joe Dolan, the park cultural anthropologist, for their support and funding for the series. We will be sending an email out to you just after this presentation with a very short survey asking a reaction to what you've heard today. Please, please take the time to answer the questions because it really helps us to inform future talks in this series. Now, um, this is also a save the date. Our next presenter is Dr. Greg Cajete, Professor Emeritus from the University of New Mexico. Dr. Cajete is from, um, is a Tewa author and artist from the Santa Clara Pueblo and the Director of Native American Studies at the University of New Mexico. He um, has written numerous books, among them being Native Science, The Natural Laws of Interdependence, and Igniting the Sparkle, an Indigenous Science Education Model. He has given many talks around the world and is well known as a pioneer in reconciling Indigenous perspective in sciences with a Western academic setting. Um, when I would be luckily, lucky to be invited around the world to speak, it invariably happened that wherever I went, the first thing people would say is, oh, Greg Cahady was just here. <laughs> and, and he just has a, a wide range. Uh, anyway, I think you would really appreciate his talk. Um, it will take place on September 10th at noon Pacific uh, Daylight Time. So I want to thank you all so much for your interest, so much for uh, being on this, um, the, for con, uh, continuing to be a part of this series. And again, Robin, I just thank you so much for your wisdom, your heart, um, your spirit, and what you've shared with us today. Um, and we will see you soon. So aheha, hagone, and goodbye. Bye, Mopi.